talk about. So they go above and beyond what the actual scriptures say. And have you ever experienced that? I think we all experience that at least some point. Whether it's through a preacher, and, and, and I think that's a good thing for you guys to be able to check what I say. And if at any point I go above and beyond the scriptures, please come check me on that and say, is that actually, or, or are you going beyond what the scriptures are saying? And so 1 Corinthians 4 talks about that because that's important, right? Because if the church becomes consumed about things that God didn't talk about and that he and his perfect wisdom didn't say are important, then we are off base. We are not following God. We are no longer Christians, but just a reflection of our own mindset. And then he ends the chapter, verse 19, and this is kind of how I want to start the sermon today. Verses 19 to the end, he says, but I will come to you soon. This is Paul talking to the church in Corinth, or the churches in Corinth, and he says, but I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod or with, a, or with love in a spirit of gentleness? That word there, power, is interesting. And I love how, how Paul, he's talking about specific situations. And then in the middle of, of like debating and telling them they're wrong, he steps out and he says a beautiful phrase that reflects God's understanding of God's own kingdom. He says the kingdom of God in verse 20 does not consist in talk but in power. What does that mean? The word power there literally means dynamite. The power that God has in our life, the power of God's love in our life is like dynamite. Now, if any of you know anything about my family, the Kusiks are one of the craziest group of individuals I've ever met. My family is nuts. So growing up, we grew up in the Baptist denomination um, down in, in McGuanago, and there was a dude that I loved so much. Um, one of the reasons why I loved him is, as a young guy, he would sell us sticks of dynamite in the church. And uh, my dad was in the military, and I loved him, and he would be gone for long periods of time. And my brothers and my friends and I would buy a bunch of sticks of dynamite from this guy. You could only buy quarter sticks of dynamite, bring them home, but you can tie a bunch of them together <laughs> and, and do crazy things with them um, without asking for, for permission, right? And so what we would do is we would blow huge holes in my dad's backyard. He had, you know, four acres, and so we were like, oh, we could do that. Well, we kind of got bored with it, and we wanted to see, you know, we've always heard that, like, dynamite would um, be – uh, different the closer it is to water. So we tried to get it as close as we could to the pool. We'd light it and then jump into the pool to see what kind of a shockwave we could create and then ride the wave. Um, I ended up blowing a couple massive holes so that when my dad came back from the military, he wasn't happy because I destroyed a large portion of the grass. So we, I didn't have to mow that portion anymore. <laughs> Dynamite changes everything, though. If you've ever seen uh, the after effects of what dynamite does, it blows up everything in the vicinity. And, and, like, spiritually, the love of God is dynamite in your life. It blows up every part of your life, even the parts you didn't want God. When God comes in your life, he changes things as integral to who you are as your ego mental health, as your sexuality, all these different things that you probably might be okay with God not touching, you want God to, to, to help form 80% of your life, but you don't want him touching some of it, his love is going to powerfully change every part of you. It's going to make you more faithful, more patient, more gentle, more self-controlled, more you're not very joyful, it'll help you be more joyful. It'll help you be more loving to those that you don't naturally want to love. The power of God is about the only thing that will ever pierce a hard heart that doesn't want to change. 
The power of God is the only thing that can bring a church that's divided or a marriage that's divided back together. And this is why Paul is bringing it up. Because Paul, Paul understands that like, if they don't get chapter 4 right, there's no real reason to get through all the rest of the chapters. Like He can talk about their sexual problems in chapter 5, or you know their hair problems in the other chapter, or the communion problems in the other chapters. But it doesn't really matter if they don't get the first thing. God's right. It doesn't matter. Because they don't even want to change at that point. And so he starts off with that. And I love how chapter 4 ends. Like, the solution to arrogance in a divided church is the power of God in love. That'll change everything. And so now we're jumping into chapter 5. And it's about sexuality. And it's we're not going to have, like, a, a debate or a sexual class today. It's, it's going to be just kind of right? We're going to look at the case of what's going on. We're going to look at the remedy and then the reason for what's the solution and then a reflection on the world in general. So starting on chapter 5 says verse 1, it is reported, it is actually reported that there's sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. Let's pray today. Father, I thank you for your word. As we jump into your word, I pray that your word would challenge our assumptions, our cultural assumptions, our personal assumptions, that we would be more like you at the end of this passage. Amen. All right, so we jump into this passage, chapter 5, talking about immorality in the church. What do we do? What do we do with this situation, right? So, like, setting up the passage, understanding when it says that there's immorality, sexual immorality, the word there used is porneia, is the generic um, word for sexual immorality. It's basically anything outside of marriage. So, anything outside of God's plan for his creation, whether it's before marriage or during marriage with someone else, it is all God's standards under this word. So whether it's adultery, whatever the case may be. Well, what's happening in here is specifically this guy is sleeping with his stepmother. Don't do that, all right? Um, that is something he even says, like a lot of the pagans, like Romans and Greeks, they don't do that. I, I think it's interesting. Um, you guys, like even amongst um, like Hollywood, that wasn't really accepted what happened with him, right? That's interesting, right? Because we all understand to some extent that um, whether it's incest or something like that, that there might be a level of exploitation that's a little worse. Uh, regardless, what does he do with this? What does he point out? He points out, number one, that there is pride in this affair. Now, what is he talking about? Is he, is he talking about how like they're proud of their sin and they don't want to give up the sin, or that the church is proud that they're not disciplining? And it might be both, right? Like, there could be a couple different instances of pride here that are actually going on within this church. But this whole idea of, of Paul uncomfortably talking about sin in the church goes against our culture, I would say, in at least two specific ways. Number one, I think it goes against this idea of moral individualism. And I think moral individualism is something that's very much ingrained in us. This idea that I'm just myself. Right? Because we can go to church and, you know, get our coffee in the morning, go to church, sit down, do a go back home, and then that's the extent of my Christianity, where, like, my Sunday and my, my week is all about me and what I can get out of the church for me. And we go to church and we think that, that honestly, this isn't much of a team sport. I'm just in it for my personal relationship with God. Yes, there is a personal relationship with God, and that is very important. But the church body is something that God calls us to, and that idea is radically different than our culture. That we are a group, and not just an individual that happens to attend a sermon, a self-help group, or something like that. That we are not just for ourselves, but for the 
far? Well, that goes against our culture. Our culture says, no, you don't have to. Like, if someone else sins, and I get that, right? Like, I'd rather not have to deal with other people's sexual sins. It'd be really nice if I never had to deal with that. That would save a lot of headache, right? But this is what Paul is doing. And there's reason why God does that, right? Like, uh, you know, I've heard that, you know, like, why does God care who people sleeps with? You know, why doesn't he just, like, give it up? Like, um, let them love who they want to love. And I understand that. The idea is, is that if you understand that you yourself are created in the image of God and you are sacred, then God cares about yourself. It's this, I, this idea that even comes out even in mental health many times where we see that it's good to understand that even how you think and who you are as an individual is important to God. And if your mental health is off, God cares about that, and he wants to love and redeem you and bring you back into a good relationship with him. And that goes against this idea of moral individualism. But then also, I would say, secondly, expresses individualism. This idea that I decide in myself what is right. Again, this is the opposite of traditional cultures. But specifically in the Bible, it goes against this, that you don't get to just decide what is right and wrong in your own life. You don't get to decide what is sexually okay and what is sexually not okay. God, our creator, is the standard, regardless of how uncomfortable that may make us think or seem or feel, our feelings can be off. Because we are all created by God in his image, and he knows what is best for us. Short term, And that's two ways in which the gospel, in which the Bible, in which God is specifically different than our culture. But then what's going on here, right? Like when you look at this chapter as a whole, what's going on? What, like, I believe he's talking about a case for church discipline. And this is the hard stuff, like the, the stuff you have to jump into that's not great, right? Like I'd rather give sermons about, uh, um, you know, Jesus' death on the cross and, and, and how it saves us. But sometimes it's important to have the difficult conversation. Because if you don't have them, what's going to end up happen, happening is this stuff just continues to go on and on and is never dealt with. And the, and, and the church's purpose it is not happening, right? Like, so what's the purpose of the church? Why do we do this? Is this is this just like a book club where we come and read the book together and have a good time and, and have games? No, I think there is a deeper purpose to what is happening in the church. The church and our purpose from God is to have people who believe in him become more like him, become disciples of Jesus and then help others to become disciples of Jesus. It is, yes, both singly, but also there is a group mentality as well. And that's important. This church discipleship comes out. And I feel like um, once you travel outside of America, you understand that um, Americans are very individualistic, right? Like if you've ever gone to Africa or Europe or South America or Asia, a lot of these other cultures, or a reason uh, where uh, most other cultures are quite a bit more community-based rather than Americans, I would say, are more on the end of uh, individualism. And so we, we see this idea in the scriptures that God desires us to be a part of a community and a community that helps follow God. desires in the church. The problem is, is when you don't confront sin in the church, because that's what Corinth is doing, they're not only having arguments and disagreements and having a divided church, but they're not confronting sin in their own church. What ends up happening is the culture invades the church instead of the church invading the culture. Now, what's the remedy? Verse 3 and on, 3 to 5. Paul says, for though absent in the body, I am present in the spirit as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Wow, 
first time I read this, I was like, oh, man. Like, this, this seems like totally insane, right? Like, what does this even mean? Like, deliver him up to Satan? That seems pretty extreme, right? Well, that this idea could either mean one of two things, whether you take it literally or whether it's giving the body over or the sinful nature over. So if it's talking about the body, he's literally saying, let's have this guy killed so that he actually still reaches heaven. I don't believe that's what the scripture is teaching, specifically because we see in chapter in in. 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 through 11, where he talks about how the guy actually came back to the church and repented and stopped sinning, and that was the entire purpose of it, right? The purpose wasn't to kill the guy. The purpose was to help his sinful nature die. And, and the whole purpose of any church discipline or any actions that try to right someone when they're in the wrong should be for reconciliation and repentance to come back to God and come back to the body. The purpose is to help them, not to hurt them. But in so doing, as we read verses 3 through 5, what is he talking about then? If it's not literally delivering him this body, but if it's actually talking about the sinful nature, the fleshly part of our heart and our nature, the part that is under the dominion of sin, right? Because sometimes when you get locked into a sin, you just love your sin more than everyone around you. You love your sin more than your family. You love your sin more than your job. Your, your whatever, whatever the case may be, you may love that part of your sin more than everything else. And so he's wanting that part of you that's under the dominion of sin to be set free by doing what many times we think the opposite should happen. But actually, it leads to softening up your heart by waking him up, right? Because ultimately, the gospel hits us in the heart and calls us to repentance so that we follow God and sin is destroyed in our life. And so what I believe Paul is calling us to is, is he's showing us that the act of fellowship is actually bigger than we truly, first of all, understand. Because when you understand, like, Satan's dominion is outside of the church, right? Like, what, ha what ends up happening is you understand church is God's invasion force into this world. And that when you give someone up, when you put someone outside of the church, that you're giving them up to Satan, the world, and their own flesh. And you're saying, hey, live it up, man. Go live your best life now and see if you find any true joy in it. The problem is, is when you're not walking in the spirit, when you're walking in the flesh, and you're put out of the church, Something crazy happens that I don't think we always understand. Um, and I want to I wanna illustrate it a couple different ways. Um, so in ancient times, they used to fight in a special unit called like a phalanx, where all the soldiers would come together and they would interlock their shields. And if you remember when we went through Ephesians 6 on Wednesday nights with Chris Welson, I think like a year ago, um, this idea was brought up that like Christian brothers and sisters, when you're going through a hard time, in a, whether it's a death in the family or sickness or a spiritual attack or whatever's going on, what ends up happening is we actually bear each other up in, in our gifts and we help essentially our shields of faith cover one another and we support our brothers and sisters in the church as best as we can. And when someone gets out of the church or gets bumped out of the church, you're actually like kicked out of the phalanx and you no longer have the protection of God's army. Does that make sense? It's similar to the, the sad and terrible story in the Old Testament when King David wanted Bathsheba and he kicked out the general. He said, actually, in the middle of a battle, let's all retreat. And this famous warrior, one of his famed warriors, was going to solo the entire army and that didn't go very well. He ended up dying because when you don't have the support of people guarding you all around, you fall to the arrows of the enemy, and that's what's happening here. He's saying if this guy wants to live how he wants to live, if he wants to live his best life now, and if he wants to follow his heart, he needs to see where that path leads. And when you see and when you feel and when you experience that path, you understand that it doesn't truly bring you 
love and joy and peace like you were designed to have through listening to our Creator. Because our Creator knows what's best for us, right? He's the one that designed us. And so when you are out of fellowship, it's an enormous thing. It's not a little thing to not come to church. I think we have that mentality of, like, oh, it's not a big deal if I skip church, and then skipping church becomes a habit, and then years down the path, we're like, oh, I haven't been to church in years. And we don't always see the difference in what ends up happening when we are outside of that fellowship, outside of that gathering. Because this guy was hung out to dry. It, it's similar to, um, I would say, another illustration would be radiation, and the church is like a fallout shelter, right? Like, if there is radiation everywhere, which spiritually I would say and argue that there is, with literally demons and Satan and your own flesh working against you, and the world system, the cosmic system working against you, there is radiation everywhere. God's fallout shelter, the church, it's going to affect you in ways that you don't even think about. You are not protected then from the attacks of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And you can't do it all by yourself. You were never designed to solo Satan, your own flesh, and and the world system by yourself. God always meant it to be a team. And so in a way, they are loving this guy by putting him out so that he understands that he can't have the best of both worlds, that he can't continually live in unrepentant sin and enjoy the fellowship of the church simultaneously. And I think we don't understand sometimes because we don't take the church seriously enough. But let's continue reading this, verses 6 through 8, to see the reason for discipline. Your boasting is not good, verse 6. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you really are unleavened. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sometimes the best way to love someone who is stuck in a sin is to love them with the truth. It's what many times we call nowadays some tough love, right? And so he illustrates it with the Passover, right? So like with the Passover, we remember the story we read in Exodus. Exodus, they had to leave really quickly to get to Exodus. And that, because of the speed, they couldn't let their bread rise. And so they had unleavened flatbread, essentially. And what, that, what, what I believe God is focusing on here is that what ends up happening is with the church, because we just try to live and let live, that mentality is actually destructive to the church. It's like yeast in your bread, or what I like to think of, it's, it's like mold in your bread. Even though we know that the church is doing good things in our lives and in the lives of those around us, it's not okay to have some disgusting things be a part of God's family. And it's good to root that out, and it's good to deal with it in a healthy way. Now, there are unhealthy ways to deal with discipline, right? Like, even when he talks about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and, and, and he talks about how they're bringing them back, he says, actually, don't be too harsh with the guy. Don't continue to make him feel bad and, and park him on the boat of shame where he never gets off that. But there is a point where when someone does repent, you are to welcome them back and forgive and love on them so that they feel welcome back into the family of God. But what ultimately ends up happening, and I love how in the answer, verses 6 through 8, you see this idea of celebration. Verse 8, let us, let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven. He's saying God, God is wanting us to live lives that are celebratory to God, right? Like we are to be thankful for the salvation that he's given us in our entire lives a feast and a celebration response 
death on the cross for us. Celebrating correctly, if we're celebrating while sinning unrepentantly in our pride. And I love that idea because it actually, I think, shows that anytime you are living in sin, you're actually living in a way that you think will bring you more joy, but it actually doesn't. A writer once said that we are paddling, or, or we, are, we are playing in, I'm going to paraphrase this here, we are playing in mud puddles, essentially, trying to find our own joy when we could be sailing the ocean of joy with God. Where God's plans might seem restrictive when he says, no, don't have sex with whoever you want, actually get married. Like, why? Like, why is that, why is that important? Why is, why is a covenant seemingly so important to God? Because God's a covenantal God. He loves us, not just in any old fashion, but in a covenantal fashion. And that's why it's important to the heart of God. And God knows that that is best for us and for our joy, for our mental health, for every aspect of us. God views us and loves us holistically as we are to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. He loves all of us deeply and in ways we don't even get. Right? Like, because when the way that we love our kids many times is completely different than the way they love us. And they don't even understand why we love them and why we want the best for them and, and, and why we put them down certain pathways so that they will feel loved for their entire life in different ways and in different aspects. God's the same way. His ways are higher than our ways. One of my favorite verses in Romans chapter 8 Verse 28 says, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. There are lots of time in lives where in our life where we don't understand why we are going through something, whether it's a temptation or it's a trial or whatever the bad case may be in our life. But we know that God loves us in such a way that he will turn anything that is bad in our life for our good and for our joy. Because he desires us to live our lives as a feast and celebration of him as the Passover lamb. We are to live our lives in a constant state of Passover joy. That is completely different than everyone else around us, than the world. And lastly, I want to reflect on the world. He ends this chapter, verses 9 to the end, uniquely. It says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy or the swindlers or the idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world, but, I, but now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Wow. So, he ends it on a strong note, a classic Paul. He gets people on every side of the aisle. It's so easy, I think, um, for us in church to... Um, to have problems with other people's sin. It goes back to Jesus' idea of we're always looking at the specks in other people's eyes without looking at the logs in our own, right? It's very easy for us inside the church to be like, hey, even when we're reading this passage and we see that they have pride, what, when I noticed that they had pride about their sin at the beginning of the passage, I was like, hmm, what is that? It's like gay pride month. And I started to go down a tangent. But then the end of the chapter hit my heart and made me check myself and think, man, you know what? I'm always looking at the sins of others. And I'm looking for the problems that other people have. Like, it's much easier for me to see my wife's sins than it is to see my own sins. It's very much easier for me to see the sins of people whose sexuality 
or identity is different than me, and, but it's very easy for me not to look at my own. Even when I was looking for illustrations for this sermon, when I was looking and, and reading and, and watching videos of other preachers preach, it's very easy for any religious person to look at the sins of others and say, man, they're bad. I can't believe. I don't even understand how they're this bad. But he's saying, no, as Christians, what do we have to do with judging the outsiders? Like, yes, when, yes, we do preach the gospel and we say God loves you and we do call for repentance when they want to come in, but that's not our main job is to sit there and, and judge the people on the outside, right? Like he's saying, guys, I'm writing to you, First Corinthians, because you have problems on the inside. You have problems with yourself, with Christians. Right? Like it's reported that there's sexual immorality among you, not the people on the outside. It's very easy for me to, to get angry at the sins of others. And there are terrible things, right? Like when we hear of slavery, that's a terrible thing. When people mistreat children, that's a terrible thing that our heart gets mad at. But our heart doesn't easily get mad at the sins that we commit ourselves because we don't view ourselves the same way God views us as sacred image bearers that he loves enough to die for. So what does he mean, verses 9 through 11? Not to associate indiscriminately, right? Like, of course, we still want to bring people to come to church, but this is where I think a membership would come in and be helpful to understand this idea that sometimes... When you're sinning, it may not be the best thing for you to just have communion and act like it's not a problem. When you're actively sinning and you don't think it's wrong, you're actually proud about your sin. Yes, God calls us to not judge outsiders. But he wants us, as his people, to not be proud of our sin, to be in incredibly gracious toward cleaning house inside of the church, but absolutely also engage with all of sinners because God does want us to love all the different types of people in the world, right? And it is our responsibility in the church to love in spirit and in truth. And it's very easy for the church to swing to one side or the other too much. To love just in truth but not with truth. And anytime you swing towards one or the other, you can get off basis and then you're not following God. Ultimately, he writes a hard chapter like this for the benefit of the church and because he's listening to the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't just write this up because he's like, you know what, I'm going to write chapter five and this is my opinion chapter. Like this is my opinion piece on the church and the church needs to just follow my opinion. No, he's listening to the Holy Spirit on this matter, desiring the church to repent. That's the whole process. The whole idea behind church discipline is repentance and restoration and bringing someone back to the faith. Whether it's Second Thessalonians 3.15 or even when Jesus talks about rebuking and restoration in Matthew 6 and 8 and in Galatians chapter 6, all the different passages in the scripture that talk about what do you do with someone in your church family, in the body of believers, who say, forget it, I'm just going to live my life. But there's a process, a gracious, a loving process, every step of the way, not to bring them into shame so that they feel terrible, but to bring them back into the fold because God loves them. And that just saying live and let live isn't actually loving. But he desires us as his people, as his hands and feet, to be people that love on them, sometimes in a tough way, but to ultimately bring them back to restoration with God's family and with God. Because what ends up happening with this letter is this guy came back to Jesus. And his relationship with Jesus became important enough to give up what he sexually wanted. And if you know anything about sexuality, that's one of the hardest things to, to, to mess around with, with so, in someone's life. 
life, right? Like, you can't just say, hey, stop doing that. 99% of the times, people don't listen, and it comes to that. But when the power of God gets involved, as we started off in the end of chapter 4, only the power of God can change someone's life. And when you're outside of the church and you feel the power of the darkness, the power of Satan, the flesh, and the world completely unbridled, and you see that it actually doesn't bring you the love and joy and peace that you thought it always would, you'll want to come back to God. You'll want to come back to the church. You'll want to come back to God's original plan for you. And that's what we in the church call repentance. And that's a good thing. That's a helpful thing. It's helpful for you in every way, whether it's your mental health, whether it's your physical health. There's so many things. When you come back to the church, I love it. Even this morning, when I came this morning, uh, Nathan Wells leads a prayer time, and we just pray for one another. Whether there's sickness, like our little buddy Owen that we're praying for, or there's family drama, or there's a relationship issues, or there's job issues, or whatever the case is, Whatever issue you're going through, we can all come around one another and pray for one another, and it's powerful. Because when the love of Christ pierces our hearts and the problems of our life, there's nothing like it in the world. There's no amount of pleasure, of sex, of anything that compares to the love of Christ and its power in our life. The kingdom of God is just better. 100% every day of the week. That's why, like, a Sunday morning sermon isn't just what God has to offer. It's not just a pep talk, and then you go live your life. The, the, The church is every day. It's amazing because I get to experience it as a pastor where I meet up with people throughout almost every single day. And we pray, we talk, we hug, we cry, we get mad, and then we get back together. There's so many different facets of what the church is, and yet God calls us to something that's so much more than our many times fragile little understanding of what the church is. The church is God's kingdom, God's invasion force, and it's more powerful than anything else in your life if you allow it to be, if you involve your life into it, if you are vulnerable to what God can lead your life into. And if you're open to God's power and God's kingdom, it will change every last bit of your self. Let's pray. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for chapter five. It's a hard chapter. It's not one of the nice ones. But God, I pray that we would take it to heart and learn from it and change and be more like you, because that is the purpose of the church. The gospel, to understand that your love and the death on the cross is powerful in our life and changes our life because you've loved us, because you got off your throne in heaven and came and died for us. Help us to love you in return. In the name of Jesus, amen.